What a privilege I have to welcome each and every one here to the morning worship service at the Bremen Church of Christ. We have visitors as we always do. We're so thankful that you've decided to be with us. We would ask you please to take just a moment, fill out an attendance card, pass that to this center aisle. We'll pick that up at the close of our service this morning. We meet every Sunday morning at 9 o'clock for Bible study, 10 o'clock for morning worship, 6 o'clock Sunday evenings, 7 on Wednesday for our midweek Bible study. Brother Johnny McDaniel, our song leader, has selected number 138 as our first song. If you wish to turn and be ready for that at the appropriate time, 138. Brother Blake Wilson will lead our minds in prayer at the appropriate time. Brother Sidney White will bring us a message of the hour. And Scott Williams will conclude our service this morning in prayer. Concerning those on our prayer list, Brother Noel Butler is to, scheduled to have a heart procedure this week on the 17th. Ken Glover has now established a date for some upcoming shoulder surgery on September the 21st. Jane Spake also continues on our prayer list as well. You're also asked to continue to remember Sister Sue Gross as she discusses some upcoming cancer treatments. My cousin uh, Scott and Ellen McBrayer's baby, Wyatt Wynn, also Barbara Cron. We did speak with her this past week. She continues at the home of her daughter. They did confirm that she did break a bone in her back, but is, does not require surgery. She will continue in therapy now for several more weeks, but she wants everyone to know she really appreciates the cards and phone calls that she has received. She would appreciate more of those, and she misses us very much. Addie Hunt, also Betty Gray's mother, is uh, now back at home from a recent trip to the emergency room late last week. The church has received a thank you note from the Vera Adams family. will be on the bulletin board here in the hallway. Richard and Shirley Smallwood announced the birth of yet another great grandchild. Kevin William Corbell was born this past Friday morning to Richard and Shirley's granddaughter Amble, Amber Corbell and her husband Wayne who live in Carrollton. So congratulations to them. Brothers Keepers Group 1 is scheduled to meet next Saturday, the 18th of September at 6 o'clock at the home of the Allens. There's a sign-up list in the foyer. Uh, group 3 meets next Sunday, the 19th, following the evening service. Finger foods are requested. Two gospel meetings begin in the area this week, one at the uh, Villa Rica congregation, Brother Tyler Young, who was with them about three years ago. Uh, we'll conduct that gospel meeting. They uh, meet this afternoon at 2 o'clock, but there will be no evening service for that gospel meeting this evening at Villa Rica, only this afternoon at 2 o'clock. However, that meeting will continue through Wednesday at 7.30 each evening. Gospel meeting at Villa Rica with Brother Tyler Young. There's also a meeting that begins next Sunday at the uh, Cedartown congregation, Brother Alan Webster from Jacksonville, Alabama, also the author of many of the articles in the House to House Heart to Heart publication that we participate with. Brother Alan Webster conducting a gospel meeting at Cedartown next Sunday um, through the following Thursday. Also a gospel meeting to put on the calendar at Tallapoosa, Brother Terry Wheeler, no stranger to us in this area, will conduct a meeting at Tallapoosa October the 3rd through the 6th. We've announced to you previously the Silencing of God Dave Miller live event, which will be at the West Georgia Technical College campus in Waco, the one next to the interstate. We do have some flyers to advertise that meeting. We'll have much more to say about that as it gets a little closer, and we will have some local uh, TV, or not TV, but newspaper and some radio advertising and some other things that we hope to do to promote that event, which again is a collaborative effort of several of the area congregations in West Georgia. The truck from the children's home will be here tomorrow, the uh, 13th of September, as you've seen in the foyer. We've had lots of good participation concerning that event. If you wish to bring an item, please have it here by tonight. They'll be here tomorrow to pick that up. Also, the Change for Children uh, Georgia Agape cans, if you have uh, been participating in that, we'd ask you to bring that back by next Sunday evening because the uh, executive director, Brother Doug Mead, will be here 
next Sunday evening to present to us what's happening with Georgia Agape, and he'll take those cans back with him. So please uh, return your change for children cans by next Sunday evening. The church picnic is scheduled for September the 25th. We'll be here on the premises. Brothers Keepers groups leaders will be uh, responsible for certain things and you will be contacted as to what you're requested to do. Bow with me, please. Holy and righteous Father, we're thankful for many blessings of life, for the opportunity that you provided for us this side of eternity to meet with those of like precious faith. We're very thankful for that everything that is as well with us as it is, that we can have the opportunity unmolested to worship thee in spirit and in truth. We're hopeful that our worship today will be acceptable and pleasing in thy sight and will be edified as a result. For those that lead us in a public fashion, Father, we ask that you give them good remembrance of what they prepared to lead us in or to say. The men that lead us at the Lord's table, Brother Johnny, as he leads us in our song service, worship and song, and Brother Sidney, as he breaks unto us the bread of life. May he hide behind the cross and give us those things that are most needful for us at this time. Father, we're mindful of those that we've mentioned specifically this morning that have been sick, those that are to have procedures upcoming. We're thankful for those that have been able to recover from recent infirmities. Continue to watch over and care for them as we do same. For the many gospel meetings in this area, Father, we ask that you give that gospel free course that it may pierce the hearts and minds of those who need it the most. May we be encouraged by preaching that gospel and may it fall on good and honest hearts. Continue to watch over and care for us, Father, and forgive us as we repent of those things that are wrong in our lives. This is our humble prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing now number 138. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When darkness fades, his lovely face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Both his covenant, his blood, support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, here then is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I let in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, for the less to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. Be seated, please. <clears throat> For the Lord's Supper this morning, we'll sing number 151. 151.
come to the part of the service where we assemble around the Lord's table to eat these emblems that represents the body and uh, the blood of Jesus Christ. Do this in memory of me, Jesus said to his disciples. Two thousand years have come and gone or more and we're still doing this as a memorial memory to him. So today, do this in memory of me, Christ. Set aside uh, the things of this life that so easily besets us and partake in a manner that is well-pleasing and acceptable to God. Let's give thanks for the bread. Almighty God, we thank you for the day and for our lives. We thank you for once again for the opportunity to gather around and partake of these emblems. May we do so in remembrance of thee. May we do so pleasing thee in an acceptable manner. We thank you for this bread that the Christians mean the body. We give thee our thanks in Christ's name. Did we miss anyone in serving the bread? If, you, if we did, if you raise your hand, we'll serve you at this time. Let's give thanks for the fruit of the vine. In like manner, Heavenly Father, we give thee thanks for this fruit of the vine, which represents the blood that was shed upon that cross upon Calvary so long ago in our stead. 
Fathers, we pray as we partake of this, our minds will return to that day and for the, what it, this, this event means to us. This is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Was anyone overlooked in the serving of the fruit of the vine? This now concludes uh, the partaking of the Lord's Supper. As a matter of convenience, uh, the elders have seen fit that we take up an offering collection to the Lord at this time. Would you bow with me, please? Almighty God, we, once again we bow in thy presence thanking thee for life and thanking thee for every blessing that comes from thee. We realize that everything we have come from thee and it's just loaned to us for a little while. We ask that our hearts will be right in these matters as we pertain, retain, return a portion of our physical earthly goods unto thee. We ask us that you'll bless us as we do this in Christ's name.
554. 554. Listen to our wondrous story. Once we dwelt among the lows, yet Jesus came from heaven's glory, saving us at awful cause. Who saved us from eternal loss? What did he do? Was he now in heaven and to see? No angel could our place have taken, highest of the high, though he nailed to the cross, despised, forsaken, was one of the God and three. Saved us from eternal loss. What did he do? Was he now in heaven interceding? Will you surrender to the Savior now before him humbly bow? You to shall come to know his favor. He will save you, save you now. Who saved us from eternal loss? <clears throat> what did he do? Was he now in heaven and to see? For our prayer number 149. 149. Nearer still, near. Hey. 
Father, we thank you so much for everything that you bless us with each and every day that are too numerous to count. Dear Lord, we thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you for this time you've allowed us to live and to come here and have fellowship one with another, learn more about your word, learn what we can do to become better Christians, to serve you better, bring others to you. Dear Lord, we are so thankful for the avenue of prayer that we can come before you as our Father and we as your children, to talk to you. Dear Lord, we thank you for the church here. We pray, we pray that you will bless the church that meets here. Help us to grow in spirit and in number if it be your will. Dear Lord, we thank you most of all for your son Jesus. We thank you for, thank you for your willingness to send him to earth to die on the cross for our sins. We thank you for, for his willingness to come to earth and die for us. Dear Lord, we pray for your forgiveness for our sins that helped to put him on that cross. Dear Lord, we, we pray that you'll be with us through this service and whatever life you see fit to give us. In Jesus' name, amen. Certainly always a pleasure to sing praises to God. It's been Extra special pleasure this morning. The singing has been wonderful. Thank you for joining in. We have a good crowd here. I'd like for all of you to report back next week the same time, and we will do it again. Right now, we're going to sing number 70 before the lesson. Number 70, Hallelujah, Praise Jehovah. We'll sing verses 1 and 3, and let us stand for the song before the lesson. And let's sing out together. Hallelujah, praise Jehovah, from the heavens, praise his name. Praise Jehovah in the highest, all his angels praise, proclaim. All his souls together praise him, sun and moon and stars on high. Praise him, O ye heaven of heavens, and ye floods above the sky. Let them pray, just give Jehovah, for his name alone is high. And his glory is exalted, and his glory is exalted. And his glory is exalted far above the earth and sky. All ye fruitful trees and cedars, all ye hills and mountains high, creeping things and beasts and cattle, birds that in the heavens fly. Kings of earth and all ye people, princes great, earth judges all. Praise his name, young men and maidens, aged men and children small. Let them praise his gift, Jehovah, for his name alone. His high and his glory is exalted, and his glory is exalted, and his glory is exalted far above the earth and sky. 
Be seated, please. Invitation song will be number 218. Turning in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 5, we're going to continue and, Lord willing, conclude a study that we began last Lord's Day from a statement that is made within that chapter, 1 Corinthians 5. While you're turning there, let me join with Chris in expressing our appreciation for your presence here today, especially those who are visiting with us. I'm not sure what the occasion is, but we've got a whole row right up here. Uh, we're glad to see all of that clan here today and other visitors scattered throughout. We are delighted that you have chosen to be with us on this occasion. I do want to take just a moment to commend you. I noticed uh, out in the foyer that there are a lot of brown bags out there, and most of them are filled. And so when the children's truck gets here this week, we will have a good supply of goods to to give to them, and certainly you are to be commended for your cooperation and participation in that uh, good thing. We do that a couple of times a year, and I know that we often announce that we're going to do it, but it seems like the brown bags work really well, so we may try to just keep that going if we can keep enough brown bags around. But we are appreciative of your efforts. Um, this may be an announcement that some of you don't want to hear, but uh, I'm going to make it anyway. We're actually beginning our sixth year here uh, this weekend. Uh, we've completed five, in our opinion, at least wonderful years as uh, working with you here in the Bremen congregation, and uh, we're looking forward to much more in the future. Uh, but I know for some of you it may seem like a lifetime that last five years, but you're just going to have to tough it out. But we have thoroughly enjoyed it. It's been a blessing to our lives that we have been a part of this church and we hope in some small way that we've been a blessing to the congregation here. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5 there was a problem in the church at Corinth. A man had his father's wife and as Paul was addressing this letter to those brethren he addressed that problem. Now most of the time when we think about the basic sins that are committed and mentioned within the book of 1 Corinthians, we talk about chapter 5 as the sin of fornication. But that's really not the thing that Paul was discussing in that chapter. That's what brought about his discussion. But the problem that he is dealing with in that chapter is the fact that the church had done nothing about it. He is discussing the fact that rather than, than mourning over this situation and dealing with this brother in this particular situation, he said, you are puffed up. And then in the concluding part of the chapter, verse 13, he says, therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person. We mentioned last week the phrase put away. We look primarily at that phrase in and of itself as it is used within both the Old and the New Testament. And we noted in that regard that there are numerous things that God, through the prophets in the Old Testament, through the writers of the New Testament, instructed the people to put away from among themselves. We talked about everything from strange gods to strange wives to idols to all forms of wickedness. God simply says, put it away. But in our study this morning, I want us to focus especially on this statement in its context in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, because he is very specific in this regard. In this chapter, he is talking specifically, initially, about the man who has his father's wife. And so he says, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. So it would seem obvious from that statement that the wicked person, singular, in this case, is the man who has his father's wife. Put him away from among you. But now, when we think about that phrase, what is exactly involved in putting away? I believe if we just look at the chapter itself, there are four different expressions 
that are used within this chapter itself. And when we combine those four expressions, I believe we'll have a good concept of what he means when he says, put away. For example, in verse 5 of this chapter, he says, To deliver such an one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. He uses the expression there, deliver such an one unto Satan. Then he talks about the reason for that, in order that the spirit might be saved. We may not fully understand what the phrase deliver such an one unto Satan really means in that regard, and we're not going to go into that in detail. But then I want you to drop down to verse 7. He uses another expression. When he says, purge out, therefore, the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. We're familiar with other passages where the words leaven and unleavened are used in a particular context, a little leaven, leaven at the whole lump. He's simply dealing here with a matter of influence. He is saying to these people that you are children of God. In 1 Peter, Peter talks about those who have purified themselves in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto an unfeigned love of the brethren. Paul, in writing to the church at Corinth, says to them uh, to come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. The idea of purging is not a new idea in the Scriptures. It's not a new idea to us. The idea of purging, getting out that which is not what it ought to be in compliance with everything else in a given case. And so he's simply saying to these people, ye are unleavened. You are pure. You are children of God. Here is one who is no longer pure. Therefore that, that must be purged out, taken out from among you. Then in verse 9, he says, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to keep company with fornicators. Now that's what this man is. He is a fornicator in the general sense of the term. And so we now are beginning to see a little bit more specifically what he means. Have no company, not to keep company with fornicators. Then in verse 11, he says, but I have written unto you not to keep company. Now there's the same idea again. Then in verse 11, the latter part of verse 11, he says, with such an one, no not to eat. Now I believe if we'll be honest with ourselves, it would, be, it would not be difficult for us to understand what is involved, what Paul is commanding of the church at Corinth relative to this fornicator. Whether you look at the phrase, deliver him unto Satan, have no company, no not to eat, purge out, all of those expressions put together simply say to us that such an individual, as described in this chapter, is not to be treated as a faithful child of God. He is not a faithful child of God, and he must be marked as such and recognized as such. Not to keep company, no not to eat. Now, I doubt seriously that if Paul, even by inspiration, could have found two statements that it could have been more simple and plainly understood than those two. Not to keep company, no not to eat. I realize that whenever we talk about things like this, there are those who always want to make excuse and continue to keep company and continue to eat with. But Paul is very plain in this regard. That is our responsibility as a faithful child of God. So when he's talking about this person who is a fornicator, he simply says you don't keep company with him, you don't eat with him, you put him away from among you. But there's another thought within this context that I want us to consider as the real basis of our study this morning. And that is in verses 10 and 11. When he says, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or with idolaters, for then must ye needs go out of the world. But now I have written unto you not to keep company. If a man that is called a brother be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, 
with such an one know not to eat. So now that we have looked at the specifics of this context, Paul adds something to that. He said not only are you to treat this person that is specifically mentioned in this chapter that way, but there are others who are to be treated the same way. And then he lists them in this regard. It is amazing that some way through the years, we have tried to maximize and minimize sin. We've tried to maximize some sins while minimizing other sins. But I think it would be wise for us to look at the scriptures in that regard. For example, in this very context itself, when he talks about a fornicator, he talks about an idolater, he talks about a drunkard, he also talks about one who is covetous. We don't usually think about them in the same ballpark, do we? In Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 through 21, Paul speaks of the works of the flesh which are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft. Then he closes with revelings, drunkenness, and such like. But right in the middle of that, he categorizes things in that same list that we don't usually think about so much. Wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies. You see, those are listed in the same list with murder and fornication and adultery as being those who will not enter the kingdom of heaven. I realize, as you do, that there are some sins that have greater consequences of an earthly nature, more far-reaching effects from an earthly nature than others do. But when it comes to a matter of heaven and hell, sin is sin. So when we begin to maximize, minimize, then we may be getting in a little bit of trouble in that regard. But look at the list that he talks about here, covetous person. He talks about one who is an extortioner, literally here an extortioner, is one who desires to take advantage of another. Now that we use that word in uh, pretty, I guess, um, uh, more specific terms today. But literally an extortioner is any person who for any reason tries to take advantage of another person. That's an extortioner. Whether they're out to gain money or knowledge or what else. Uh, I, I, you know, I remember back uh, years ago, I don't think this has happened in the last several years. I'm pretty sure it had in the last five years, so that clears all of you in that regard. But I can remember times in the past where certain women of the congregation would become very close friends with my wife until they found out they could not get information from her about what was going on in the church for them to use as gossip or whatever. That's extortion. That's taking advantage or trying to take advantage of what is, might be called a friendship to an advantage to them to get knowledge that they couldn't get otherwise. You see, we don't think about things like that very much, at least not in the same categor uh, categorization as, as uh, fornication, murder, adultery, those kind of things. But Paul puts it in the same list. For those that we're not to have company with, those we're not to eat with, those we're to put away from among us. But he doesn't stop there. He talks about those who are guilty of idolatry, an idolater. I find this to be an interesting word as well. Because literally here the word idolater is taken from the original word which is used and translated in John 10 as a hireling. You remember that context? in which Jesus was talking about a good shepherd versus a hireling. And then when you look up the word hireling, you'll find two basic thoughts in connection with that. Number one is that here's an individual who is really not that interested in his or her responsibility. Does that sound like any of our brethren? Does that sound like any members of the church? who by virtue of their way of life show that they are really not interested in their responsibility as a Christian. That's what a hireling is. And that's what the word idolater is right here in this context. The second aspect of that word hireling, not only are they not 
that interested in fulfilling their responsibility, but at the same time, they do not handle that responsibility faithfully. And their lack of faithfulness is due to the lack of interest. Does that sound like any brethren that you know? Who claim to be children of God, but by virtue of the way they act, they show little interest in their Christianity, and they do not handle it faithfully. There's another individual who Paul says fits into the same category as this fornicator with whom we're not to have company, with whom we're not to eat, but is to be put away from among us. But then he goes on, he talks about a railer. The word railer simply means one who is guilty of blasphemy, speaking evil of another, the idea of reviling. And we know in the latter part of Ephesians chapter 4, uh, Paul mentions that very uh, same idea of those that we're not to speak evil one of another. We're taught to, to speak that which is edifying one to another. You ought to take your Bible sometimes and, and just go through the 14th chapter of 1 Corinthians and see how many times the word edify or some form of that word appears in that chapter. Just one chapter. And basically what he's saying is that whatever is done, whatever is spoken, is to be done or spoken to the edifying, building up, strengthening of the body of Christ. Question. How much of my conversation and how much of your conversation would be left unsaid if we only spoke that which would edify, build up those about whom we speak? That'd eliminate a lot of conversations, wouldn't it? Because a lot of our conversations are speaking against other people. That's what the word railer here is all about. That's a person who fits into that category as one who is to be put away, with whom we're to have no company, one with whom we're not to eat. You see, that's serious charge. To be guilty of speaking evil of another. Then he mentions the drunkard. We usually think of the drunkard as one who is intoxicated to the point that he's lost his senses or whatever. But there's an interesting use of that word in Ephesians chapter 5 and in verse 18. Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess. So you hear those who want to talk about social drinking and saying, well, I can, I can drink socially, but I don't get drunk. Be not drunk. The word drunk there. Again, in the original, suggests the process of becoming drunk. It doesn't mean out of the loop, so to speak. <clears throat> it's talking about one who is in the process of getting there. What does that say about one drink, or two drinks, or three drinks? While you may still have some control of your mental capacity, whatever, you're in the process of getting there. That's what Paul condemns. If that doesn't condemn social drinking, I don't know what would. The process of becoming that person who engages in, in that kind of activity is one with whom we're to have no company, one with whom we're not to eat, one who's to be put away from us. So you see that list intensifies when you begin to look at it in this regard. But then I want us to go a little further with this. Turn to 2 Thessalonians uh, chapter 3 for just a moment. And you'll notice within that context... In uh, verse 6 beginning, Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, not add to the tradition which ye received of us. For yourselves know how ye ought to follow us. For we behave not ourselves disorderly among you, neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labor and travail night and day, that we might not be chargeable to any of you. Not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, not working at all, but are busybodies. Now them that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ, that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. But ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing." And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man, and have no company with him, that he may be ashamed. Did you notice that phrase? Have no company with him. That's the same expression that Paul wrote back in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 
So not only do we have the list, the fornicator, the covetous, and so forth, that he gives us in, in 1 Corinthians 5, but now he adds to that list when he writes to the church at Thessalonica with the same expression, have no company with. So whatever it means back there, it means here as well. Why not if not? And so now he's talked about withdrawing. And, and so there's another expression. Deliver to Satan. Have no company with. No not to eat. Put away. Withdraw. All of those expressions are right in the same vein of what is to be done to those who fit into these categories. But in this context, he uses the word disorderly. That ye withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly. I've used this illustration many, many times in trying to explain that statement. Because many of you are old enough to remember Gomer Pyle, USMC. And when it came on the air, everybody was out of step except Gomer. And we know that's not the case. He was the one out of step. Everybody else was in step. That is what the word disorderly means. It means out of step. And so those that he's talking about here obviously are out of step with God's word. They're out of step with what God has commanded of us. It's really a general word covering any sin of which one will not repent. But then he gets a little more specific than that. He first of all talks about those who will not work. He says they should not eat. Those will not work. And then he goes on and notice in verse 14, if any man obey not our word by this epistle. So a part of his word by this epistle is that a man work. And so those who are, for whatever reason, not willing to work, fall into this same category as those who are to be withdrawn from, put away from us, not to eat with, have no fellowship with. But then he adds a second category in that regard. Not only are these people not working, now they have become busybodies. They've become busybodies. So there's another area. There's another individual that you can add to the list of those as that fornicator in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Now folks, this may get downright personal for a lot of us. But you and I both know that there are a lot of folks on the face of this earth who just simply cannot stand it if they don't know everything that's going on in everybody else's life. And that's true in the church. There are brethren who do everything within their power, whether it's deceitful, conniving, whatever it is, to try to find out things that may not be any of their business, but they're going to make it their business. They're in the same category as that fornicator in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And you know it's amazing how well Satan can use good things for evil purposes. Telephones, emails, text messaging, those things can all be used to tremendous advantage. And we, most of us use them to some degree. But how often do we send out emails as a busybody? How often do we text trying to find out something that just may not be any of our business? I've even heard brethren say, well, I know this is none of my business, but, well, let me tell you something, that's where you ought to butt out. If it's not any of your business, you ought to butt out right there. If you don't, you're in the same category as the fornicator in 1 Corinthians 5. That's the way Paul lists it. And that's the way God desires it to be. So we really need to think about this thing. When we think about somebody who's a fornicator, an adulterer, a drunkard, we know what we want to do with those people. Well, we want to deal with them right here and now. If somebody's sticking their nose in somebody else's business, we just like to excuse that. Well, you just have to understand that's the way they are. No, we don't have to understand that's the way they are. It's a violation of God's Word, and they can change. They need to be exhorted, and they need to be admonished to do just that. Why? That the Spirit may be saved in the day of judgment. 
How interested are we in really saving our own souls? How interested are we in saving the souls of others that we may know that fit into this category or these categories as the case may be? And so that's, that's the way Paul words it in this regard. Those who won't work, those who are meddling in other people's business, literally they're the busybody, is those not busied in their own business, but over busied in that of others. And that, that word, 1 Timothy chapter 5, 13, 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 15, is used as well in, in that regard. So when we think about this 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 13, you know, God's word is, is plain if we'll just listen to it. As we noted in the Bible class this morning, Paul instructed Timothy to preach the word, to be instant in season, out of season, to reprove, rebuke, exhort, with all long suffering. And the reason was the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. You know, there are certain areas when we talk about folks just don't want to hear it. They don't want, it, they don't want sound doctrine. They don't want you to get on things that affect them. But folks, when we're going around from house to house, bad-mouthing the elders, bad-mouthing the educational program, bad-mouthing the song leader, bad-mouthing the brethren, whatever, you know, we may be dissatisfied with some things that are going on, but that doesn't give us the right to violate God's will. We need to act like children of God. And not be busy in those kinds of things that are described. And if that is the case, then we need to repent of those things. Else we will be found guilty in the day of judgment. We're going to face that judgment. Every one of us will be there. None of us are exempt. And so when you look at that statement, put away therefore that wicked person. Don't just see that wicked person as that fornicator in that chapter because Paul said not only that person but all of these others that he lists. In those two contexts, with the same language, have no company with. That's our responsibility as children of God. So I hope we'll take this lesson for what it's worth. And as Paul said, examine ourselves to make sure that we stay busy with our own business and not try to busy ourselves with other people's business. That we'll live our lives in harmony with the will of God. That we'll not be covetous. That we'll not be like that hireling who is indifferent and not faithfully discharging our responsibilities. But that we'll focus in on what God's Word really is. And we'll stay with it to the best of our ability. This morning you may not be a child of God. You can become one. If you have sufficient faith in Christ as the only begotten Son of God to turn away from sin and confess that faith, you can be buried with your Lord in baptism. Become a child of God. Or if you're a child of God, you've wandered away. You've allowed Satan to interfere in that, that uh, trip to heaven. You can ask God's forgiveness and He'll forgive. If we'll confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us. If in any way we can assist you in that regard this morning, we would encourage you to come as we stand together and sing the song. There's a fountain free. It's so you and me. Better say so. It's free. Is the fountain of love from the source above. And he gives us all freely drink. Will you
closing song will be number 286, 286. If you filled out an attendance card, please pass that to the center aisle. It'll be picked up as we sing this final song. Invite you back for our evening worship at 6 p.m. We will have pew packers at 540. I hope to see you at our evening worship. We'll sing verses 1 and 3, where he leads, I'll follow, and then we'll be led in a closing prayer. Sweet are the promises, kind is the word. Hear a father than any message man ever heard. Pure was the mind of Christ, sinless I say. He the great example is and pattern for me. Where he leads I'll follow, follow. Come unto me, weary, heavy, laden, and sweet rest for thee. Trust in his promises, faithful and sure. Lean upon the Savior, and thy soul is secure. Where he leads, I'll follow. Dear God, as we approach your throne, asking you to look down with favor upon us that our worship to you today has been a sweet smell in your nostrils, that you put your arms around us, hold us close, love us as we love you. Guide us now as we depart Help us to attain our respective homes safely. Bring us back again that we might sing these songs and worship you truly. Guide us now in our lives. Keep us safe from all harm, but keep us as we keep you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>